we're going to dive right in today and start talking about decolonization and nation building with the struggle for independence in Africa. Our years of focus, 1945 to 1964. World War II had made many Africans aware of nationalist feelings and unable to continue to tolerate colonialism. After independent political states were created in Africa, much of the continent remained economically dependent on former colonial powers. Economic dependency led to neo-colonialism. Before independence, France was already prepared to take a neo-colonial role in her African territories. The post-war French government granted independence to Tunisia and Morocco between 1952 and 1956. However, France was determined to hold on to Algeria, which had substantial French settler population, vineyards, and oil and gas fields. It was a huge influx of money for France. In 1958, President Charles de Gaulle proposed a referendum to grant independence to the African colonies while retaining influence over them. An Algerian revolt broke out in 1954, and it was pursued with great brutality by both sides. However, it ended in 1962 with French force withdrawal and independence for Algeria. The African leaders in sub-Saharan French colonies were reluctant to call for independence because they realized that some of the colonies had bleak economic prospects. And because they were aware of the importance of the billions of dollars of French public investment. Nevertheless, all French colonies achieved independence between 1958 and 1960. Most of the sub-Saharan Africa achieved independence through negotiation, not violence. But even without war, the new states suffered from a variety of problems. And that included arbitrarily drawn borders by European powers. An over-dependence on crops, on crops that were exported, a lack of national road and railway network, and overpopulation. On the other hand, some of these newly independent nations benefited from colonial legacies like bureaucratic institutions and infrastructure. Some of the politicians who led the national movement devoted their lives to ridding their homelands of foreign occupation. And two examples would be found in Ghana and in Kenya. By Kwame Nkrumah, the independent leader and later president of Ghana, and Jomo Kenyatta. And he negotiated the independence and then became the first president of the Republic of Kenya. Decolonization in Africa often involved struggles because people of European descent fought against indigenous Africans in an attempt to retain personal privileges, as well as control of resources and political power. Conflict was particularly severe in the southern part of Africa, including the Portuguese colonies of, Ango of Angola, the British colony of southern Rhodesia, which is modern-day Zimbabwe, and in south and southwest Africa, where the European settler communities had tried to delay colonization. In South Africa, different ethnicities were separated by apartheid, literally meaning to keep apart. Whites and blacks were unable to compromise in Southern Africa. Decolonization in the Congo brought direct superpower intervention. Patrice Lumumba became the Congo's prime minister, but the government was incredibly weak. And in 1965, Che Guevara of Cuba tried to lead a small group of Cuban rebels into the Congo. And he tried to avenge Lumumba, who was viewed as a hero. The U.S. continued to support Mobutu, who had overthrown Lumumba in exchange for access to Congo minerals. In Latin America, independence from European rule was achieved earlier, but American and European economic domination increased. In Mexico, the revolutionary rhetoric of the ruling Institutional Revolutionary Party was accompanied by a large and persistent disparity between the rich and the poor, the urban and the rural. In Guatemala, President Jacobo Guzman attempted to expropriate the property of large landowners, including the United Fruit Company. And this prompted the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency to assist in a military coup that removed Jac Jacobo Arbez Guzman from power. And this also condemned Guatemala to decades of political instability and violence. Cuba in the 1950s was an island divided by economic prosperity and poverty. 
The Cuban leader, Fulgencio Batista, presided over a corrupt, repressive regime, while the U.S. and a small class of wealthy Cubans dominated the economy. Fidel Castro came from a comfortable middle-class family, and in 1958, Castro and Che Guevara prepared an offensive on Havana. And that is how Castro rose to power. He led a popular revolution in 1959 that forced Batista to leave the country. Once he came to power, he redistributed the land, lowered urban rents, raised wages, and seized the property of U.S. and Cuban corporations. In 1952, Guerva would travel across South America. He traveled to the Congo in 1965 and then on to Bolivia in 1967. There's little evidence that Castro undertook his revolution to install a communist government. But faced with a U.S. blockade and the, you know, the Embargo Act, he turned to the Soviet Union for economic aid, thereby committing his nation to economic stagnation and dependence on the Soviet Union. In 1961, the U.S., via the CIA, supported a group of Cuban exiles in an attempt to overthrow Castro. In April of 1961, some 1,500 Cuban exiles whom the CIA had trained landed at the Bay of Pigs in Cuba to overthrow Castro, but the attempt failed, providing Castro with a public relations victory. The Cuban Missile Crisis also brought the war, the world to the brink of nuclear war. To help the Cubans with the U.S. trade embargo, the Soviets agreed to buy their entire sugar production, and the revolution brought significant changes to Cuba. In 1967, again going back to Che Guevara, Guerra tried to instigate a popular uprising against the corrupt Bolivian government. Across Latin America in the 1960s, authoritarian dictatorships were increasing in power and oppression. Chile had a long tradition of democratic government. In 1970, an alliance of left-wing parties won the election, and Salvador Allende, a Marxist, became president. Argentina was also dominated by a military government in the 1970s. The U.S. supported these military dictatorships because they opposed communism. In 1955, representatives of Indonesia, India, and Egypt met at Bandung, Indonesia, to discuss regional interests. Ahmed Sukarno led Indonesia to independence from the Dutch in 1950. In 1947, as you guys know, Britain agreed to partition India into two countries. Nehru and the Indian National Congress managed to shape India into the world's largest democracy. Gamal Abdel Nasser overthrew King Farouk of Egypt in 1952. In 1956, the British, French, and Israelis attempted to retake the Suez Canal in Egypt. Nasser was popular with the Arab world because he supported Palestinians and opposed Israel but he was less popular after the Six Days War of 1967. In 1955, Indonesia's President Sukarno hosted a meeting of 29 African and Asian countries at Bandung, Indonesia. This meeting marked the beginning of an effort by the many new, poor, mostly non-European nations emerging from colonialism to gain more weight in the world by banding together in what became known as the Non-Aligned Movement or Third World. Leaders of the so-called third world countries preferred the label non-aligned, but because the movement had the sympathy of the Soviet Union and included communist countries such as China and Yugoslavia, the West did not take the term non-aligned seriously. For the movement's leaders, non-alignment was primarily a way of extracting money and support from one or both of the superpowers. One example is the ability of the Egyptian leader Nasir and Sadat to play the the two superpowers against each other to get assistance in hydroelectric projects, arms, and loans from both sides. After World War II, both the Soviets and the Americans built up huge nuclear arsenals. Both Japan and China were able to take advantage of the superpowers' preoccupation with the Cold War. The American occupation of Japan from 1945 to 1952 gave Japan a constitution that allowed the country only a limited self-defense force and banned the deployment of Japanese troops abroad. In 
the Japanese stayed out of the Cold War and thus concentrated on building up their industries and engaging in world commerce, gradually developing new markets in Southeast Asia. The Japanese government aided businesses in developing three industries that were crucial to Japan's emergence as an economic superpower after 1975, electricity, steel, and shipbuilding. This is what will allow Japan to host the Olympics. We'll talk about that in your Olympics DBQ. From 1945 to 1949, China underwent a civil war between the nationalist Guomindang Party of Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong's Chinese Communist Party. Mao set out to completely revolutionize China from the bottom up. China was deeply involved in Cold War politics, being allied to and receiving aid from the Soviet Union in the 1950s. In 1953, Mao tried a five-year plan of state-run heavy industry and collective farming. The People's Republic of China and the Soviet Union began to diverge in 1956, and Mao introduced his own radical policies with the disastrous Great Leap Forward. This was a plan for making China economically competitive with the rest of the world. This plan began in 1958. Mao also began a cultural revolution in 1966. Mao divided the Communist Party into two factions, and by 1961, the Communist Party had privately reduced Mao's authority. China became more repressive during the Korean War. The rift between the PRC and the Soviet Union opened so wide that President Richard Nixon was able to establish a cooperative relationship (coughs) between the U.S. and China in the early 1970s. In the 1960s, Mao mobilized the youth of China in a cultural revolution. Young Chinese were organized into units called the Red Guards, looking out for disloyal communists. Mao used the Red Guards to attack the rightists and experts who had opposed him during the Great Leap Forward, which, by the way, resulted in the deaths of 50 million people. By 1968, the Cultural Revolution had brought China to anarchy and an economic standstill. Simultaneously, there was a power struggle within the Communist Party. In 1972, U.S. President Nixon agreed to visit Beijing. And after Mao died in 1976, Deng Xiaoping won control of the party and of China. As the Arabs slowly gained gained independence in the post-war years, the struggle with Israel came to overshadow all Arab politics. After World War II, intense pressure to resettle European Jews forced Britain to turn the Palestine question over to the UN General Assembly, which voted in November of 1947 to partition Palestine into two states, one Jewish and one Arab. Israel declared its independence in May of 1948 and defeated the Palestinian and other Arab forces that attempted to crush the newborn state. In the Six-Day War of 1967, Israel took Arab lands, including East Jerusalem, the West Bank, the Golan Heights, the Gaza Strip, and the Sinai Peninsula. The Palestinian Liberation Organization, headed by Yasser Arafat, waged waged guerrilla war against Israel and engaged in acts of terrorism. The growing demand for oil in the post-war era prompted the oil-producing Arab states to form the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, in 1960. OPEC embargoed the U.S. and the Netherlands for their support of Israel during the Arab-Israeli War of 1973 and quadrupled oil prices in 1974. So just take a look at the maps here. Territories. Major events. The Cold War and the tremendous post-war economic recovery focused public and government attention on technological innovation and enormous industrial projects. Only a few people warned that technologies and industrial growth were rapidly degrading the environment. The student protests of the late 1960s in the United States, France, Japan, and Mexico indicated a rising current of youth activism that focused attention on environmental problems. Moreover, the rising price of oil increased awareness of the problem of finite natural resources. The 60s, folks. The 60s refers to more of an attitude than a strict chronology. 
new er era of agitation and activism, which college students were at the forefront. Young people upset social inequalities and reject corporate commercialism. The hippie movement included many new trends, such as root music, smoking marijuana and using psychedelic drugs. Sexual revolution is part of the youth movement. The advent of birth control pills facilitated sexual experimentation without the risk of unwanted pregnancy. In 1968, the political power of the youth increased around the world. 1967 was a summer of love in which the youth experimented with new cultural and political traditions. American youth were also protesting racial inequality via the civil rights movement. It also contested the continued U.S. role in the Vietnam War. There were negative sides to the youth movement, including division in the U.S. states, which became incredibly apparent by 1968 after Nixon won the presidency. France was a center of student protests in Europe. In Eastern Europe, the youth targeted oppressive communist regimes and played a prominent role in the Prague Spring, a mass movement of worker strikes and student protests. In Mexico, the large school-age population protested the party of institutional revolution. Tragedy that struck throughout the colleges with youth movements. However, the youth movements of the late 60s did not affect immediate change. They did have long-term implications for transforming society and politics. In the summer of 1968, Mexico was experiencing the birth of a new student movement, but that movement was short-lived. On October 2nd, 1968, 10 days before the opening of the Summer Olympics in Mexico City, police officers and military troops shot into a crowd of unarmed students. Thousands of demonstrators fled panic as tanks bulldozed over the Teletico Plaza. Government sources originally reported that four people were killed and 20 wounded, while eyewitnesses described the bodies of hundreds of young people being trucked away. Thousands of students were beaten and jailed, and many disappeared. Forty years later, the final death toll remains a mystery, but documents recently released by the U.S. and Mexican governments gives a better picture of what may have triggered the massacre. These documents suggest that snipers posted by the military fired on fellow troops, provoking them to open fire on the students. The Thamasset University massacre was an attack by Thai forces and far-right parliament paramilitaries on student protesters on the campus of Thamasset University in Bangkok, Thailand on October 6th, 1976. Prior to the massacre, four to 5,000 students from various universities had demonstrated for more than a week against the return to Thailand from Singapore of former military dictator Thanam Kitakorn. The day before the military, the Thai press reported on a play staged by student protesters the previous day, which allegedly featured the mock hanging of the crown prince. Any, any uh, negative words, thoughts, any negative ideas in Thailand against the royal family is a crime, just to give you some background on this. In response to this rumored outrage, military and police, as well as paramilitary forces, surrounded the university. Just before dawn on October 6th, the attack of the student protesters began and continued until noon. To this day, the number of casualties remains in dispute between the Thai government and survivors of the massacre. According to the government, 46 died in the killing, with 167 wounded and 3,000 arrested. Many survivors, however, claim the death toll was well over 100. And this photo here is actually was was taken in Thailand. It is a student who was hung. The student in this picture is now dead, but for hours after his death was continually beaten. And here there's a chair that is about to be smashed over his head. So in conclusion, just to summarize everything we've discussed, take a moment to pause it, review it. If you have any questions, as always, send me an email. Otherwise, have a great night, guys. Cheers.